these are just a few of the engineering and methodologies that I uh, utilize as an engineer working for Hughes Aircraft and the Xerox Corporation. Many of these methodologies can be correlated to medical science. Some of those areas include etiology, epidemiology, pathology, and pathogenesis. Uh, the following slides are some samples of some of the tools that we use in the, the field of engineering. And I applied uh, these tools with respect to my diabetes in the following video is a overview of my perspective relative to type 2 diabetes from an engineering perspective. So I've been somewhat fortunate to, to, to have such a great mother and, and a great daughter. And before we get into the biology of this disease, it's important to understand what causes diabetes. <laughs> now I'm not going to explain this chart to you, but this is what we do. Engineers, we just love creating them charts. <laughs> and so... In engineering, we use different methodologies such as failure modes and effects analysis. Uh, we use Ishikawa diagrams, uh, which is basically a fancy name for a fishbone, to basically do root cause analysis so that we understand at the cellular level what's happening with respect to um, a disease. We do the same thing with electronics and software. And then we love to develop flow charts to try to understand the dynamics of the disease. What are the sequence of events? How does disease actually develop? And, and again, the only reason why I'm showing you this is just to show, you know, I love pictures. <laughs> and, um, but from, from all of those pictures, and what's really important to understand is that, and I think everyone in this room knows, uh, some of the key factors, obviously, are nutrition, exercise, your emotional health, your spiritual health, um, your lifestyle, and we, all of those are under our control. There are other factors, such as your, your ethnic background, your family background, uh, the health care system. <laughs> um, all of those um, you don't really have <laughs> under your control. Um, and, um, and what that leads to from a biochemical perspective, when you look at this disease at the cellular level, it's basically a disease of insulin resistance, microinflammation, excess oxidation. Those are the underlying mechanisms that fuel diabetes. Ironically, those are the same mechanisms that fuse heart disease, that fuel um, cancer that fuels uh, stroke, arthritis, osteoporosis, kidney failure. Now is it a coincidence that the diseases that I just named happen to be the top seven diseases, afflictions in America? No, I don't think it's a coincidence. And when you look at some of the other complications, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, chronic fatigue, <laughs> they're all related, they're all connected to the same disease. The good news is you, you, you can choose to be well or be sick. You have that type of control. But what is diabetes? <laughs> um, there are three types of diabetes. Type 1 is the autoimmune disease, and actually that is the only diabetes, by the way. Type 2 was misnamed. <laughs> they should have gave it some other name. Call it gobbledygook, doesn't matter. But by calling it type 2 diabetes, you connect the two diseases, and both diseases follow a similar protocol, drugs. 
And gestational diabetes is just a temporary form of type 2. Every person in this room already knows the answer to beating this disease. And once I give you the answer, you're going to go, I knew that. Because I'm going to take a wild guess and make the assumption that everyone in this room got to eighth grade. And in eighth grade science class, we were taught about the unit of life. The unit of life is a cell. And when that cell is happy, you're happy. And when you're happy, you're healthy. But when that cell is sick, guess what? You're sick. And you develop diseases. And what happens to a diabetic is the outer shell of that cell becomes damaged. It becomes inflamed. And the insulin receptors lose the ability to recognize insulin. If the insulin receptors cannot recognize insulin, then glucose can't get into the cell. So insulin acts like a key that opens up the garage door to let in the glucose. But if the key doesn't work, can't open the door. And if the door doesn't open, then the glucose backs up into your bloodstream and your blood glucose continues to rise. The pancreas then secretes out more insulin because it sees that your blood glucose level is continuing to rise. Consequently, most diabetics develop um, excess insulin within their, uh, within their bodies. And the, you can't produce energy. You're tired all the time. Your body is unable, not only is your body unable to absorb nutrients, your body can't get rid of the toxins from the chemicals that you're, that you're consuming. In addition to that, your cells lose the ability to communicate. It's a new science, maybe some of you have heard about it, glycobiology. And it talks about the ability of your cells to talk to each other, to communicate. And if your cells lose the ability to communicate, you're going to be sick. Uh, this chart represents the uh, insulin glucose profile for a non-diabetic. When a non-diabetic eats food, their blood glucose level rises, then the insulin rises, but it all levels off somewhere between 80 to 100 milligrams per deciliter. In a non-diabetic's body, the glucose level continues to rise, insulin levels continue to rise, and they never return to normal. And they stay at very high levels. And what's important to understand about that, if your body has excess insulin, then you have the probability of developing uh, microinflammation. Microinflammation is a precursor to the formation, well, you, your body form, formulates homocysteine, which leads to plaque formation inside the endothelial wall of the arteries. That leads to atherosclerosis and other cardiovascular conditions. And what this just represents is the vicious cycle that the diabetic's body is going through every time a diabetic eats food. 